Okay. Okay, now there was this awkward moment at the beginning of the pitch to find the right distance from the microphone. So you guys can give me signals, you know, it's like, oh, further. Okay, first of all, do I have a clicker? Or, thanks, Rutger. I want to come clean about the title because I don't like it anymore. I think it's arrogant and full of jargon. So future is about making predictions. Nobody really knows what's going to happen, right? We have to guess. Sovereignty is about control, and consent is about freedom. So I'm going to talk about predictions for controllable freedom. First of all, when we talk about future, I like this vision of the future. So we're not living in year 2018 now, but rather in 12,018 because that's when our civilization started. That's when we started developing. That's when we as humans started shaping nature to what we actually need. So, I would like to do a little bit of a crowdsourcing exercise now. Could you please stand up? No, 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 please don't spill the beer. It's not that important. Okay. So, nature and virtual reality. When do you think that what we see as nature around us will become indistinguishable as what we can see in virtual reality? If you think this is going to happen over the next 25 years, please sit down. Okay, we have some techno optimists and some techno skeptics. Okay, if you think it is going to happen in the next 50 years, please sit down. Ah, aren't you the interesting guys? Cool, I'm gonna memorize the faces. I want to talk to you afterwards. I always like to know about the problems that people foresee. Thank you, and please sit down. So, what is nature? Nature is messy and chaotic. We have been trying to model it, to simulate it, for many, many years. And our best tool that we have thrown in it is mathematics. And what it has given us is basically chaos theory. Uncomprehensible mambo-jambo, unless you're either extremely passionate or slightly autistic. You probably don't understand the hell of this thing, right? This is, this is our best expression of what nature actually is. And there are few people on the planet that are really able to comprehend that nature of nature is becoming inceptive. So, what we like to do as human beings is we like to apply control to somehow tackle this chaotic mess of things. Okay, who has ever studied control theory from a mathematical perspective, just out of curiosity? Okay, nice, cool. Cool guys, control theory is awesome. So, um, is this video going to play? Can we, can we play this? No, okay, sorry, don't bother, it's, it's fine. Um, so this is about metronomes, those little ticking things for music that go back and forth. And here's the funny thing, if you spin up fun five metronomes next to each other, uh, on, a, on a stable board, they will just keep going at different frequencies. But if we apply a little trick, and it has something to do with the beer, that's why I said it's important, if you put two beer cans under those metronomes, you give them an extra degree of freedom. You give them a mechanism for control. They control each other and they synchronize. And after a few moments of, of doing this, they all start ticking ex exactly the same frequency. And if you remove the control mechanism, they go back to their own, like, I'm just on my own independent thingy. So, cool, we can use mechanisms for building synchronicity. Right? That's, that's like a nice feature. And that's basically what life is doing. According to some strictly physical definitions of life, life is a system that uses the energy of the environment to decrease its own entropy. And uh, then there is all this kind of biological mambo jumbo that nobody understands except some um, really dedicated people. Um, so, biological control has been there since the inception of life. And our 
best control mechanism is of course our brain, right? Which has also evolved to apply more and more control to our environment so that we can experience more freedom as beings, right? Birds with, suffici with sufficiently complicated brains can fly and humans, well, we can do all kinds of weird things with our brains like watch Netflix all day. So there is this nice um, theory that is not exactly true, so if there are any neuroscientists in the room, please don't throw tomatoes at me. I grow them at home, I have plenty enough. Um, how the brain evolved from the basic autopilot reptilian brain to our neocortex, where we can reason and do abstract thinking and uh, we can use languages on pattern spotting, we can do all kinds of amazing things. So this has been the evolution of human brain over the millennia. And the question is, what is coming next, right? Evolution is an ongoing process, as Darwin has proved. Okay, so what has changed over the past 12,018 years? Tools have changed everything. We learned to use tools, and now we can achieve something great. We can shape nature in a way that it was impossible to do it before. Nice. So, I'm going to talk about a slightly weird way of saying this, but I took this from MIT Sloan Review, and it's a perspective, respected magazine, so, you know, bash them, not me, that's their term, super minds. What we are building now is we are building those aggregates of computers, other machines, other tools, and humans working all together in this interconnected environment to create this entity that is able of accomplishing much more as a collective than anything ever before that. So, that's also a cool thing, right? It increases our potential as a civilization to shape nature. So, what are those superminds? Um, I, I like this hierarchy, also took it from MIT, their idea. Uh, we can use them as tools, as assistants, as peers, so on the same level as us, or as managers, so something supervising us. And we have examples of all already existing. Tools for communication, best use case for technology so far. We live in the hyper-connected space. We can WhatsApp each other. How cool is that, you know? It doesn't matter where we are in the world. And assistants, yeah, we have those. All the, you like, recommended friends and recommended movies on Netflix. That's a recommended system. It takes some hassle away from you. And we have peers. That's, that's a little bit of a tough one, but... Uh, AI traders for assets, like in, in asset management, they, they use those kind of things. They are really like a, another employee. Sometimes they're not even being checked thoroughly for what they do. Just you do some investment stuff, and as long as you're making me money, I'm happy with that. And then we have managers. What Rutger talked about before, traffic lights. We all listen to traffic lights, right? They manage us. Simple, but true. And there are some other cool creations, and some people are looking into um, automated governance of a company and those kind of things. And DAO, DAO would be actually an example of a manager as well, right? Okay, so one of the ultimate goals of science these days is to link us directly with the machines, right? To build those brain-computer interfaces so that uh, it's not only us being interconnected with the tools, but also we expand our own brain capacity, actually. Uh, I see some people shaking their heads. I would love to hear why. Um, and I, li I like this picture because it's, it's real and it's solving a real problem. Um, that's an example of using a tool to accomplish something that this woman was never able to accomplish on her own because of her nature, because of her disease, right? So, she's using this tool to shape nature according to her will. I need a breather. So everything is perfect. We live in the world of enormous opportunities. It's nice to be an optimist. I really believe in healthy optimism. But there are also some challenges on the way that we need to learn how to solve. How much control do we allow the machines to take over from us? Where do we define the boundaries for this control? And I think actually first and foremost, how do we, ex do we express our own will and translate it to their machine code? 
How, do, do we have sufficiently good tools of expression? So, um, yeah, if you, if you just throw too much data at something, it becomes plainly stupid and, you know, just too much. That, that, that's not how, that's not how things work in life. And, okay, there are some machine learning models that you can train by throwing more data at them and they always figure, figure it out. But the, in the end, we can just claim that everything will be solved if we have more information, right? We need to also control flow of information. So that's one problem. We're generating so much information, but we don't control it anymore. Okay. And then what happens with this uncontrolled information? We get things like this. This is what, we, you can, what you can achieve with the interconnected reality. You can create an assassination market. Way to go, humanity. And, okay, that was grim. So let's do something less grim that a lot of people are afraid of. Data breaches, loss of control, loss of personal freedom. Somebody else controls your digital reality. That is quite a bad thing to, to, to happen to institutions and to individuals. And uh, I mean, we, we would like to control that. We don't want that to happen. And this is, this is a little bit of a different story, but uh, who studied algorithmic complexity here? Okay, great. So there is this big assumption in building algorithms that P doesn't equal NP. And it's something that 99% of people believe, but it has still not been entirely proven. And basically, if this simple mathematical foundation is not true, then 90% of, as we call it, secure cryptography that we have developed can be thrown out of the window. Um, and it's, it's, it's actually probably true, so we're probably fine with this. But we still don't understand how this mathematical mambo jumbo actually works in the end. This is fairly novel stuff. And guys, I really hope you're not spilling all those beers. Um, and one more thing when it comes to problems, okay, um, is that not everything is, not everything is fair. And a lot of institutions in the world, as they play out their strategies, they are not playing on the same level with you. They're following something called a Stackelberg's game, which is a leader and follower level game, in which the follower just says what he or she is going to do, and everybody else has to comply with it. That sucks. So, Rutger, was that a sign that I have two minutes left? So now I have one minute left. Okay. Um, how much can I go over time? Someone from organization? Zero. Okay. So I jump straight to the point that... Um, uh, oh, okay. Ah, how do I wrap this up? There should have been a timer here. Okay, you have to give me two minutes. I'll jump straight to one of my last slides, which is still quite a way to go. Yeah, build value with values, that's an important thing. And how do we do this as techno maniacs? We like to see everything in code and numbers. So I'm going to share some ideas from uh, Mark Alfano from TU Delft, who has this nice way of seeing building values as an optimization problem. That you have some attractors, things that you want to go for, and some negative things that you want to stay away from. So when you build your constraints for your optimization systems, think about those values that you're optimizing for. Stick to the attractors that are in the safe zone and get away of those nasty things that are kind of borderline that uh, you might want to, yeah, you might not want to have in your system. Because what we want to do is we want to enable this synchronicity, this synergy with machines. But we have to be very aware of what we're doing so that we don't build machines that start controlling us in the process. We want to remain free. Okay. So on this note, I would like to ask you once more to please, everyone stand up. <laughs> okay. And now all the representatives of the male gender, please sit down. Sorry that you had nothing to do. That's, that's, that's how men's life goes. Now, I would like to thank you ladies for being here with us today because I think this is exactly what the blockchain space needs, all of you, because you're also teaching us how to build our own values. So, gentlemen, warm applause for the ladies.